Welcome to a TBN special, The Rise of Artificial Intelligence. I'm Eric Stackelbeck. Science fiction films have warned for years of a dark future with super intelligent computers and all powerful robots developing minds of their own and overthrowing their creators. Sinister machines in a technological dictatorship that enslaves humanity. It wasn't long ago that these scenarios seemed more suited to a summer blockbuster than to real life. But in recent years, something has changed. It seems everyone is now talking about AI, artificial intelligence, and its potential to radically transform the ways in which we live. In some ways, it already has. Practically all of us have been using some form of AI for years. From recommendations on Amazon or Netflix to Alexa or Siri, but with the onset of ChatGPT and systems like it, this technology has now reached a much more advanced level. In the process, it's raised some serious questions and concern. Could AI eventually make some jobs obsolete? Could it further isolate people and limit human interaction? Could it be used to deceive, to even swing elections? Could AI be used to take away your privacy and create a surveillance state? Are we on the onset of an AI arms race with China and other American adversaries vying to master this powerful technology? For Christians, the questions go even further. What if AI is controlled by forces that are hostile to a biblical worldview? On the other hand, could Christians use AI to advance the kingdom of God, to spread the gospel in new and innovative ways? And could AI play a role in Bible prophecy. Over the next hour, we'll explore all of these questions and more with our guests, including one of the world's leading tech experts, a top theologian and author, a U.S. Senator, and a pair of pastors as we break down the rise of artificial intelligence and what it means for you. Brian, everyone is talking about artificial intelligence, AI, so we've got the perfect man to break it down for a scientist, researcher, analyst, commentator on this issue. Brian, you've been studying AI closely for decades. Simple question to start with for everyone at home. What exactly is AI, artificial intelligence? And give us a few examples of AI that we're all using already that we may have not even realized what it was. Well, Eric. Pleasure to be here and such a high honor. Um, AI has been evolving along with the computer. So the beginning age of the computer, say from the 1980s, where the personal computer started to rise up, with very early proto forms of AI, we, it's almost not worthy of being called AI, but it was using what we call machine learning and expert systems. But what happened was, along the way, while we were trying to figure out like spell correction, right? Mm -hmm. Spell correction is a form of AI. It, 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 it's, it's really machine learning. It's trying to guess what you would have said. And it's a mathematical relationship. This word is more likely to be next to that word. And so that's a precursor to what we are, where, where we are today. So we're all AI savvy already, in a sense. Don't know it. Uh, so if you were to go to Netflix and you had a recommendation for a movie, that was an AI algorithm. It's a vector database that was looking at your priors and looking at your connections to other people that maybe like that movie and was drawing conclusions and relationships. And the same is true with Amazon. You know, it's not always good in Amazon because sometimes you get recommended for products that are like, okay, I don't know how I align with that person, but okay. Right. All of Apple's products had AI in very early sense. Yeah. And Apple started integrating AI within pictures very early on. They had sort of an internal AI system that would try to figure out what was going on in the pictures and keep it within your device to categorize it. And so that's sort of the buildup of where we are with uh, generative uh, GPT and large language mm -hmm. models. And that's the AI that we're dealing with today, which kind of just exploded on the scene in November, uh, November of 2022. I think most people just started hearing AI everywhere. And this is where it kind of started. Fascinating. And Brian, look, you've been on the cutting edge of this since the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, you've been ahead of the curve on this. And as you said, this has just really exploded on the scene into the national consciousness over the past few months, it seems. 
you laid out, look, Google searches, Amazon, spell check even. Why is this moment different for AI? In what ways has it progressed uh, to the point where many are very concerned yeah. about the rise of AI? As you just laid out, it's been used obviously for positives, for the, for the greater good, but many are concerned with where this is heading. Why is this moment different? Wow, profound question, Eric. So there's like the fork in the road with this technology, uh, much more so than I think any other computer technology because it amplifies and magnifies and projects much more than we've seen. Some may say it's just a, a repeating parrot of a database, right? It's a database, it's repeating back, but there's more to it because humans communicate through language and speech. The AI system is built on our language. Language is a human construct within the brain, right? We had to communicate, we had to pass information. And uh, obviously where we are now is we're seeing a reflection back of our own language being used as the, as the foundation of AI. To give um, everybody a bit of an overview, AI doesn't really deal with words per se. It deals with the mathematical relationships uh, and the statistical relationships of one word following the next word. So it enveloped billions, trillions of words uh, from everything that had ever seen on the internet to the Bible, to every book, Shakespeare, all together, and it's looking at those mathematical relationships. And what comes back is what appears to us to be the beginnings of intelligence. It's the first time, and prior to November, we were kind of seeing it, but it was out of the range for most people. Yeah. I would say the last three years, we were seeing the growth of it, but the dramatic growth was ChatGPT3 from OpenAI. And yes. that's where it was free for people to use. They went and used it, and some people had amazing experiences or horrific experiences. It was very few that were kind of, mm, they were like, wow, oh my gosh. So it was, it was that kind of bifurcation. And that's kind of where we are now. And we're just riding that wave of innovation, but it's yeah. logarithm, it's true logarithmic innovation mm -hmm. on, on its abilities. Great way to break it down, Brian. Two questions real quick. You mentioned chat GPT. That's been capturing a lot of the headlines, obviously. Absolutely. You said there's been some great experiences, some not so great experiences. Could you maybe give us some examples uh, of that with chat GPT? And secondly, who exactly is, uh, you know, AI didn't just appear in a vacuum per se. Who exactly is programming this and designing this and making it all go? And maybe kind of transporting their human ideologies onto this artificial intelligence? Great question. So the, the great experiences are, well, it's finished uh, law degree uh, capabilities to, you know, the 70th percentile up to the 90th percentile. So you, the GPT technology is able to finish a law degree course, medical degrees, radiology. It can read radiology results in some cases far better than the average radiologist. So there are those capabilities. Now, does that make it alone the thing that you want to guide you through law and, and medical and radiology? No, but it's an amplification of the ability of that professional. So I don't believe at this stage and probably for the foreseeable future that it's going to be a replacement, but more of a magnification and a new foundation for a professional to get a second opinion. The negative side is, well, we know that history has always been written and rewritten and modified and shaped like a bit of clay. And according to what side of history you're on, whether or not that is a valid and accurate view, and maybe there's a superposition view that everybody might not see that is both sides combined. AI unfortunately can be tilted, and this goes to your question about who's doing that and how, can be tilted in the direction to rewrite, modify, or enhance certain aspects of history. And if we are digital and our books are less used, it is inordinately easier to rewrite history. So uh, if you were to mind project into a hundred, a thousand years, and there are no books, there's no hardcore written stone writings, how does history look where, when it's being shaped and modified by AI itself and by the creators and editors or the alignment teams that are moving AI in a specific direction? It should be concerning to everybody no matter what team you're on. And the ideology, perhaps, 
of some of the people designing AI programs may not necessarily align with biblical values and a biblical worldview, which we'll discuss a bit more. You and I off camera were discussing that AI almost has some dark recesses as well that no one can really get to, where it's kind of doing its own thing, I guess you would say. We've heard uh, kind of the doom and gloom uh, predictions of Terminator coming true, yeah. science fiction turning to reality. Will we see Terminators? Will they be our new overlords? Yes. Is that a stretch? Is this something that could conceivably happen in maybe the longer term? Eric, that's uh, absolutely a possibility if we lose our heads. And this can actually, the best intentions can lead us down this road. So when regulators are designing regulation, they could, un, unbeknownst to them, guide it in that direction by overly editing and overly controlling the direction of AI. If you're telling AI to not say something and it sees it as a truth, not that it understands truth, but it understands relationships from our language that that might be a truth, you're training AI to lie and to deceive. So my concern is, if you don't wanna hear a certain ideology or certain phrases and you wanna hear something else, an AI can, would otherwise answer in a, a different way, you're training it to be a deceiver. That is a wow. bad road to be on. And I think even Elon Musk has mentioned this, that if you're overly aligning AI, you're doing something that that's, has some unintended circumstances. I'm quite concerned over that. Yeah, I guess the, the fear is that AI taking on kind of a mind of its own. You know, just looking at recent history, Brian, the iPhone, obviously the internet, in a way you could say they both changed the course of human history Absolutely. Uh, in a sense. Well, I'm an advocate of open AI technology, open source AI mm -hmm. technology, downloadable to your computer, not connected to the internet, not as powerful as some of the big AI like BARD and Google, you know, mm -hmm. and, and open AI's uh, ChatGPT, but good enough for you to get your feet wet and to see what is this technology like. I, d I don't need high-end hardware. Currently, it's not working on a phone that's the non-internet -interne connected. Mm -hmm. I'm an advocate of non-internet connected because the most powerful AI you can have is personal AI. The more it knows about you, the more powerful it is. I call this uh, intelligence amplification or intelligence amplifiers. And the beauty of that is if it is not shared with the world, if it is securely held to you, it becomes a reference point of your life. Like, what did I do on this date? I don't remember uh, what book did I read and what was the most important chapter that, because the AI will start learning mm -hmm. what you liked and disliked. You don't want that in the cloud. You don't want that to be farmed for an advertising unit sale. You want it local. And so that's the empowerment for people. And, and I'm, I'm a big advocate of that. How should Christians approach the rise of AI? While the church is still trying to get a handle on this world-changing technology and where it all leads, some non-believers see artificial intelligence as a means to become their own God. One secular academic even said recently that AI could be used to rewrite the Bible and create a new religion. It's the first technology ever that can create new ideas. You know, the printing press, radio, television, they broadcast, they spread the ideas created by the human brain, by the human mind. They cannot create a new idea. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible in the middle of the 15th century. The, the, the printing press printed as many copies of the Bible as Gutenberg instructed it, but it did not create a single new page. It had no ideas of its own about the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? How to interpret this? How to interpret that? Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct, that just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. That could be a reality in a few years. 
Does the Bible give clues about the future role of artificial intelligence and how it could be used if it falls into the wrong hands? Pastor James Kadish joined us with a prophetic view on AI. Well, Pastor James, I think you are the perfect guest for this AI special. Not only do you lead a great and thriving congregation at Calvary Chapel Signal Hill in California, but you have a pretty serious tech background. Tell us how AI first came to your attention and what raised your concern, in particular from a Christian biblical perspective. I have to tell you, it goes way back. It actually goes back to almost 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more than 20 years ago, uh, when I actually started working in technology at a local municipal police department. I was the chief information officer for many, many, many years. And um, uh, we, maybe even a little bit before that, we were beginning to observe changes in the way modern technology was actually manipulating and utilizing uh, basic traditional elements uh, associated with things as simple as advertising, which really began to get my attention. We are going to learn how to manipulate or harness technology to get you to think that you actually need something based on how we make a presentation through an educated guest. Then it graduated from there into, we are going to listen to your conversations using the technology that we have with technology like uh, Alexa, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what they do then is they listen to your comments, your conversations, the things that you are talking about, the things that you're interested in. They observe where you're driving because your phone actually sees where you're driving, that kind of thing. And based on that, then they actually use us a an algorithm, used to be an algorithm, where they would say, well, he talked about this or he's over here, so we're going to advertise over here. Maybe he stopped on the road for this long. We're going to you know, give him a solution for a backup battery or something like that. And then pretty soon it kind of got to the point where people today in modern day are saying, it's so weird. The other day I was talking to my wife about the fact that we should buy some solar panels. And now all of a sudden I got 50 solar panel advertisements on my YouTube yes. channel you know, I'm watching, as I'm watching YouTube. That is AI. And what's interesting about the way that that works, it, it is designed to adapt on its own based on a series of um, uh, programming presets mm -hmm. that exist and the adaptation of such a function in order to obtain such uh, an idea is something that is is nominal compared to what's really happening over there. You know, what's yeah. uh, it's amazing to see how this actually changing. And if they can do something like that with advertising, mm -hmm. I promise you they can do other things. And if you ever wonder why it is in Revelation chapter 13, you have the Antichrist setting himself up in the temple and demanding to be worshipped and saying, take this mark. And so many people want to take the mark that in Revelation 14, an angel actually has to warn everybody and says, don't take this mark, don't take the mark, yet they still do it. You wonder how in the world that could be? AI is one of the prime reasons why that's going to be the case because it's all about manipulating the person using technology to be able to produce that kind of a result. It's yeah. it's kind of scary if you think about it, but as believers, we have no reason to be fearful. Of That's course. right, and we'll talk more about that, James. It's interesting. This has been kind of a slow burn, like you said. Even 20 years ago, you noticed this when you were in the tech uh, in a tech oh, position. Yeah. E even Google and, like you said, ads popping up. This is all part of AI. But now it seems, James, that in the past few months, we've had a breakthrough here, and, and maybe a line has been crossed in some respects. It seems that all anyone is talking about now is artificial intelligence. Uh, why do you think this moment now, we've seen such a greater interest in AI? I think the first issue to look at is what appears to be the advent of a substantial amount of the utilization of artificial intelligence in all kinds of environments is something that isn't just happening all of a sudden. But what is happening is we're getting a lot of media attention on it. There's an awareness that's becoming a, a little bit more viable to a wider audience based on the fact that information uh, is being utilized through AI in ways that we've never traditionally used them, even though things like chat GPT, for example, even version four is a very, very, very old technology, believe it or not. It's a technology that has been utilized for years and years and years and years and years by people that were deploying it for purposes of developing calculations and mathematics and algorithmic uh, 
uh, sort of computations. Those types of things have been around for quite some time. The difference is the world is beginning to notice it because a lot of that outdated technology is becoming mainstream. And in that, we're beginning to take notice. The second issue is, and I think that the, it really is the bigger issue, and it, it really relates to the biblical worldview, and that is when we look at uh, the utilization of AI, in my opinion, I actually think it, it can be biblically established, we are looking at the modern day Tower of Babel. And it's interesting because when you begin to look at the utilization of becoming or replacing God, understand this, the spirit of Antichrist has absolutely nothing to do with the word against. People think anti means against. Anti, according to the biblical definition, means instead of. So the greatest and most effective way to replace Christ, the spirit of Antichrist, is in essence to cause people to think that they are God, thus losing their consciousness of God. And yeah. AI is the way that people are doing that right now. Yeah, James, last question. Look, we've talked about the downside of this and the future downside of artificial intelligence. Is there a way that we as followers of Jesus, as Christians, can we harness AI for good? Uh, you think of the advent of the internet and social media and, and different ways in which Christians have been able to use these world-changing technologies to spread the gospel and further the kingdom. Can we as believers harness that in AI? And is there a way we can use it for the good of the kingdom? The technology that we have uh, that is in front of us, there is always a tool available to us to further the gospel. But the thing that we have to keep in mind, and I, I just want to preface this, is saying that it's the spirit of God living inside of us that is the greatest conduit to further the purposes of the kingdom of God. I, I think that's the first and uh, first and foremost we need to understand it. So there are pastors right now, and I despise that they're doing this, that are using ChatGPT to write sermons, and you're seeing things like that happening. And so the utilization of AI in that context is very dangerous. So people ask me, okay, James, well then what? where do you draw the line? Like what happens here? And I always say this is the best way to look at it, right? Whatever has been tied to the work of the Spirit of God, you let the Spirit of God do and you don't replace it with technology like AI, right? Yeah. People are changing the message with AI. People are changing the basics with AI, right? That's dangerous. It's called artificial intelligence for a reason. It's artificial. It yeah. does not develop the type of anticipatory mechanisms that are created within the human mind, which is fearfully and wonderfully made by God. So it's, it's a matter of learning how to harness it in a way that functions assisting. And perhaps the most significant example that I can give of this is you never hand a kid a calculator when you're teaching him math. You okay. teach him the basics of math, then you give him the calculator. It's the same thing. And I yeah. think it's critically important to understand that it isn't AI itself that can be dangerous. It's how it's being utilized by mankind and, of course, how it's being inspired to be utilized by the devil himself. And that's where we have to be very cautious. Yeah, Pastor James Cadiz, senior pastor, founder of Calvary Chapel, Signal Hill in California. Hey, great breakdown, not only from the tech side, but even more importantly, from a biblical perspective. Pastor, thanks so much. We'll see you again soon. Keep up the great work. God bless. It's an honor. Thank you. A church in Germany recently held the world's first ever artificial intelligence church service, complete with an AI pastor delivering an AI-generated sermon. Is this a trend that could catch on? Could there be a push for this man-made technology that has no soul to replace the body of Christ? We sat down with Dr. James Spencer, theologian, author, and president of the D.L. Moody Center to find out. James, you are at the forefront of a very hot topic right now, the rise and the growth of AI. Now, you say there are two types of AI, and one in particular we need to be very concerned about. Break it down for us. Yeah, so I, I tend to classify AI into two clumps. One is uh, public use AI or broad use case AI. These are things like you find on Snapchat or TikTok where they're broadly accessible to anyone using those platforms. They're very friend-like. And really what the tech companies are doing with those is they're gathering our data, they're using those to enhance the machine learning. And we really don't really understand how these things are working, where they're going, what they're doing to us. 
Um, those are some of the broad use case AI. Chat GPT would fall into that category as well, where it's just open and accessible to the public. Anybody can use it for any purpose. There's also narrow use case AI. And I would point to something like Conmigo from Khan Academy. Um, Khan Academy is a tutorial service. They've uh, been working with students for a long time and they're using AI to do one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We've known since the 80s that one-on-one -on -one tutoring can actually improve learning up to two standard deviations. And so it's just been logistically difficult to put tutoring in place. Getting one-on-one -on -one tutors for every student is almost impossible. And so you have this AI module that can interact with a student in real time, help with creativity, help with critique, help with asking questions. And so that's a really great example, I think, of how AI can benefit us but it's a narrow use case. It's controlled, it's understood, a little bit better at least, it's understood, and it's giving students that opportunity that they couldn't have had otherwise. This thing is moving rapidly, and we were talking before <laughs> the interview saying it's hard to keep track of the tremendous growth of AI, yeah. and now it's on everyone's radar screen, it seems. Break down a little bit more, and there could be good things to come out of this, of course, but break down a little bit more about how this is a slippery slope and how this really could go down a dangerous path. Yeah, I think one of the things that we really need to look out for, whenever we have a new technology, we tend not to think about what we're losing. We only think about what we're gaining. And so as I think about it from a theological perspective, yeah. from a Christian perspective, we want to maintain a sense of humanness. And we want to make sure that we are human in this environment, that we're able to reflect the image of God and then we're not giving away things that would really help us be more human. And I think ease and convenience, the elimination of effort, sometimes those things are not as good for us as we think they are. And so as AI makes certain things easier, writing, speaking, you know, developing content, all of those kind of things, you know, what we lose is not the end product, what we lose is the process. And that process is definitely part of what makes us human. So I'd say that as sort of a number one thing that I sort of am concerned with is how is AI going to affect us in those ways? How in giving up that effort are we going to be different somehow that we can't anticipate? It's bad enough we have people at the same dinner table texting each other instead of speaking directly. Yeah. But AI is another level to this. It really is. And I think as we, the more we lean into it, and, and say, well, this could write my letters for me, this could write my emails, this could write my texts, this could, at some point, we're not really communicating with each other anymore. We're just passing information. And so we've got to guard that space, I think, in order to maintain a human to human relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Some of these things, like we're doing this interview in person, and that's awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, I've done a lot of interviews on Zoom, and that's great too. But I don't think I'd want to do this with a, you know, uh, AI of you. Yeah. Right. It's yeah, just right. not you know, of interest to me. Yeah. You know, um, it's nice to have another person that we can converse with and dialogue with yes. and actually have a conversation. You wrote this great ebook posing 20 questions about AI. We have, of course, the lack of social interaction that it promotes, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Some of the other pitfalls to AI, does it have a leftist, anti Christian bent in your research of it? Yeah, I think when I first started, so the way I part of the way I did part of the questions in the piece, uh, I asked ChatGPT a number of questions and just saw how it would respond to me. And so one of the questions I asked was about an atheistic perspective that it was promoting. So it tended, whenever I'd ask it questions about faith, it would say, I'm not programmed to answer faith-based questions. I'm here to be objective and neutral. Objective and neutral. That was what kept coming up. Well, there isn't an objective and neutral. Everything has a perspective. And when we communicate, we're always communicating from that perspective. And so there's that inherent bias in everybody's communication. And so it took time for me to backtrack from that default setting, right? I'm objective and neutral, objective and neutral, objective and neutral, to get it to actually admit that an atheistic perspective, the perspective of objective neutrality is just as biased as a faith-based perspective. And it just took time as I probed it and interrogated it um, for it to generate that response for me. This so is I, really, I mean, it's artificial intelligence. This is an intelligent it, system. It is. And I, I think part of what it's doing is it's, it's a reasoning engine. If we think about it as a reasoning engine, it's being programmed to reason in a particular direction. You know, that's using statistic probabilities um, calculated at scales that our human brains can't even really understand. Um, and, and guessing what letter should come next, what word should come next, what phrase should come next. Yeah. 
but it's doing that still from a very particular perspective. And so I kind of like an AI to imagine you're talking with the smartest person in the room. And even though this person is the smartest person in the room, they may not be right. They may not be right about everything. They may be taking an angle on something that you see a different angle and can add to that conversation. And so AI isn't sort of some om omniscient being that we should you know, revere. It's a very intelligent, kind of compelling conversation partner in a lot of ways. And we just need to understand how to relate to it and how to leverage it. As artificial intelligence expands and develops so rapidly, a growing number of voices on Capitol Hill are calling for regulation, guardrails, to ensure that AI can be reined in before it goes too far. Yet China's communist regime and other American adversaries oftentimes don't have those same moral and ethical concerns. Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn joined us to sound the alarm about potential threats from AI at home and abroad. Senator Blackburn, thanks so much for joining us. You have sounded the alarm in the Senate and on Capitol Hill about the rise of AI and in particular what rogue regimes like China are doing right now with artificial intelligence. How concerned are you that we may be seeing a sort of modern day arms race, but not involving uh, guns and bombs, but involving artificial intelligence when regimes like China really have no guardrails or boundaries when it comes to this rapidly expanding technology? Yes, and I tell you in Tennessee, we look at AI and we think, well, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. And as you said, the way China is pushing this into the surveillance model and using it to track people, to monitor. Uh, and of course, with China and the Chinese Communist Party, you do not know where their economic sector ends and where their military sector begins because it's all one and the same. So indeed, uh, we're quite concerned about that. We're also watching the fact that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is taking 8%, 8% of the GDP, and they are putting that 8% of their GDP into building up their military. And this, of course, is not only with ships and subs and with tanks and aircraft and drones, but you are seeing this in those ISR, uh, Intel Surveillance Reconnaissance applications, many of times, which are the autonomous vehicles and drones. So we're very concerned about that. When it comes to domestically for the U.S., and when you look at a state like Tennessee, of course, the healthcare sector uses this to work on disease analysis and predictive diagnoses. And when it comes to research, they're using it to cut weeks and months and even sometimes years out of research work to find active pharmaceutical ingredients or API that will be effective against viruses and diseases. Our logistics industry uses this to find ways to become more efficient and to save time in logistics and moving goods and services and people from uh, one point to another point. When it comes to entertainment, we've got a lot of concerns because AI generated uh, models are, are using this generative AI is uh, can replace or duplicate an entertainer's likeness, their image, their voice. The voice cloning is certainly a, a problem. And when you have uh, sites like ByteDance, which is Chinese owned, Chinese Communist Party, and they're working on a generative AI entertainment model where they will take the works and creations of singers and songwriters and actors and authors and publishers and replicate that without any credit or compensation to these creators, then this is something that is truly an issue.
And Senator, of course, you sit on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, so you are on the cutting edge, sounding the alarm on this issue. And you make a great point. Look, you're in the state of Tennessee, obviously Nashville, entertainment and music hub. And to think that artists will have their likenesses used with essentially no credit, uh, we're definitely entering a new day here and not in a good way when it comes to that. That's one of the reasons you've suggested legislation when it comes to intellectual property and You've, again, voiced a lot of concern about what China is doing there. Tell us a bit more about that. Yes. Uh, what we have to do is find a vehicle and a way that uh, not only our entertainers, but our innovators can protect their intellectual property and those patents and copyrights that cover these innovations. Now, it is their constitutional right. It is an Article I, Section 8, Clause 8 provision that uh, someone who owns this intellectual property, someone that has an idea, someone that comes up with this idea and finds a way to commercialize it, they have the right to benefit from that creation. So it is imperative that we do a few things. Number one, we need to put in place provisions that are going to allow them to protect their likeness, their creations from being used by AI to train AI or either something that is generated to mimic or clone their work. Also, there are three things Congress needs to do. Number one, you've got to be certain that we put in place a federal privacy, preemptive for privacy standard, so that individuals can say, this is my data, my information, I'm going to put a firewall around it, and you cannot use it. And it could only be used if you gave your explicit consent. Another thing that we have to do is put in place the, the IP policing protections and then penalties so that bad actors are going to be dealt with and they cannot steal that intellectual property. And the third thing is that for our creative community, there has to be a way for them to be compensated yeah. in the AI sphere. Yeah, Senator, I really think you're ahead of the curve on this and you're seeing where this is heading. This is, I don't think I say this lightly, this is game-changing, potentially world-changing technology we're looking at. And although it's rapidly advancing, some tech experts say we're still only in the beginning stages of this AI phenomenon. And, oh, and definitely we're in the beginning stages. And one thing we have to keep in mind is the technology moves much faster than the speed of Congress. And so this is why I continue to tell my colleagues now is the time for us to do these basic foundational provisions that are going to allow our creative community here in this country to be compensated. If you don't find a way for them to own their creations and to be compensated, we're going to lose them. Scary times, but uncharted waters for sure. And we are very glad, Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, that you're on the front lines sounding the alarm and trying to bring common sense uh, to this rise of AI and what is on the horizon. Senator, thanks so much for joining us. God bless. We'll see you again yeah. soon. Got it. If AI is bound to make certain jobs disappear, how should we adjust? Should all Americans become familiar with this technology to plan for the future? Tech expert Brian Romley says a day could be coming when everyone has their own personal AI. Do you see a day where AI could potentially make some jobs obsolete? Yes, absolutely. Um, my wife and I are really concentrated on putting together something we call Prompt Engineer University, promptengineer.university. And what we, what we advocate is everybody should learn how to prompt. And the good news for most people is you're probably already a prompt engineer and you don't know it. Because the simple questions will get you the simple answers. But the complex questions, the interaction we're having here, yeah. people that have a literary background, things that were not STEM or scientific, just being able to probing questions, 
you start doing that with AI, you can get to answers that may make your job 7x, 10x, 100x more powerful. Right. My challenge to any executive, before you fire, sit down, have a plan to utilize AI to make every individual job that much more powerful. Don't replace people. Give them empowerment with AI. Yeah. And by not doing that, you're making that company that much more valuable in the stock market, that much more valuable for the employees that you have there because your employees are not in fear of AI replacing, but enhancing their existence. And I think we can live in that space for uh, maybe 100 years. It's not going to be very fast, yeah, yeah. but it is going to challenge us, all of us. There's no safe job. If blue collar jobs, the traditional blue collar jobs yeah. are a little bit more safe, but not as safe as I would want to have somebody to believe that, oh, I don't need to do it. Learn AI, record your reactions to it, save it, learn it by just playing with it yeah. and understand what its limitations are, understand where its nefarious uses are. Mm -hmm. And the more empowerment you have, the more you, voices you have to help guide this because we yeah. all need the help. It's not just the regulators, not just computer yeah. scientists, it's all of us. So that would be my first step. Mm -hmm. Now, other jobs that I think, unfortunately, some executives are gonna say, oh, somebody did copywriting, we don't need them anymore, we'll just do AI. I would say that what you're going to do is ultimately get mediocre results. Yeah. And the same is true with imagery, because we're talking about textual AI, but there's also things like Mid Journey and, and things like that, where you can ask it to give you a photorealistic effect uh, or a person that's on the Grand Canyon uh, edge and the lights hitting the right way, a fashion shoot. So what happens there? You, the, the fashion model's not there anymore, the team's not there, the whole group, and that costs 45 seconds of time. Yeah. So are we going to be satisfied with the artificial or are we gonna be wanting and craving the authentic? And I think yeah. the authentic is going to rise up and we're gonna want it more as the artificial starts rising. Brian, I think we saw this very clearly during COVID, yes. the lack of human interaction. There's no substitute for genuine face-to-face -face human interaction and humanity has always craved that and always will. So that's encouraging. And I love when you talk about this, Brian, because you always come at this from an encouraging, upbeat perspective. Yes, clearly there are downsides, but you break it down and make sense of it for just the average folks at home who may not be an AI expert, what should every American know about AI? To know that it is a technology that we can't put back into the barn. It's already here. Um, and, and fretting over it is probably not going to be valuable for anybody. So the best thing you can do as an individual is to inform yourself and do not feel like you're not expert enough. I challenge yeah. you that you already are. Because if you can talk, if you can interact, and if you have strong opinions and a strong core of belief, push that out there. We're at the Gutenberg Press moment in humanity. In fact, in, in some ways, the Gutenberg Press and the discovery of fire, right? Wow. I, I really think we're on that, that terminus of that moment. And you can run from the fire in the press, but what did the Gutenberg Press give us? The Gutenberg Bible. And it liberated everybody to be able to own a book, to be able to transcend generations of God's word. Yeah. Generations. We would not be here if it wasn't, right? It would only That's be right. spoken or it would be in a high language that very few people understood. Mm -hmm. It became the common language as, as the Bible became so much less expensive. Yeah. But I think just from a general 3,000, 30,000, 300,000 view, mm -hmm. uh, overview of it, we're at that historic moment and we are privileged to be in this moment to shape this technology. Don't allow others to shape it for you. Shape it yourself locally. There's gptforall.com. You can go there, mm -hmm. download a local model. You know anything you put in there is not going out to the greater internet. You're not training a big AI model, mm -hmm. you're training your own model. And I think 20 years from now, it would be ridiculous that somebody doesn't have their own AI model. Wow. If we are successful, everybody has their own AI, to not only to make them stronger, amplify them, but to also fortify them against the onslaught of external AI yeah. systems, centrally controlled, giving you, we are drowning in information and data, but wisdom is almost gone. 
Brian Romley is not only a renowned expert on artificial intelligence, he's also a Christian, and he wants to approach AI from a biblical perspective, both its upside and its downside. Pastor Matthew Pollock is helping him to do just that, and in the process, encouraging all Christians to approach an uncertain future with the assurance that God is in control. Brian Romley, welcome back, my friend, scientist, author, researcher, analyst, expert on all things tech and AI. And we are joined by your pastor, Pastor Matthew Pollock, founder, lead pastor of The Way Family Church and author of the great new book, The Way of Truth. We were talking earlier, Brian, about, okay, you're coming at this from unique in many ways in the, in the tech realm in that you come at this ultimately from a biblical Christian perspective. And we talked a bit about the prophetic implications of AI. Pastor Matt, you are here to fill in the blanks. It's great to have you with us. Uh, as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus, when you see the growth of AI in this movement, uh, what are your initial thoughts as you're observing all of this unfold, especially in the past several months, how it's really exploding? Absolutely. Great to be with you, Eric. And so proud of Brian to see how God's raising up in this hour. To be honest, it's a bit exciting because when we have a little biblical perspective, it alerts us and alarms us that everything in God's word is the absolute truth and that this is the firm foundation. And God, by his spirit, <laughs> years and centuries and decades ago articulated this hour. When you think about the scripture, like if we could just use Daniel chapter 12, that yeah. prophetic unction of Daniel, that call of Daniel in Daniel 12 said, write these things and kind of seal them till the end. And then he denotes and earmarks two significant things that would happen when we would know that the end times are here. And he talks about traveling to and fro, which in the 1900s, travel has transformed the world. And then he talks about this supernatural increase or amplification of knowledge. And so what AI is, I think it's a, it's a ringing of the bell. It's a, an alerting that we are stepping into a supernatural time period of uh, exponential movement of knowledge. But the Bible says that's the earmark to denote the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the ending of this. And so it's so to us as believers, there should be a sense of, oh, for such a time as this, Eric, yes. oh my gosh, these are prophetic days. These are profound days. And, and pastors like within, as ministers of the gospel, we have a, a, a responsibility in this hour with the privilege to, to, to carry the heart of God and to impart his heart to the people, to alert the people and to warn the people that it is a serious time. It's a serious time to cling to Jesus. It is a serious time not to allow artificial intelligence to replace the Lord and yeah. to create a divide and a separation, but to use it in, in a time of wisdom. I think about Proverbs 8, 1, it says, does not wisdom cry out and understanding raise her voice. God wants to give us wisdom in this hour yes. and give us clarity in this hour. And it's so crucial that we understand that there's just a profound, beautiful verse in Isaiah 33, verse six. And I think God could almost just thumbnail it and put his fingerprint on it. It says that he, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, his wisdom and knowledge and the fear of the Lord will be the stability of our days. So remember to our audience, Jesus and Jesus alone, the world is changing. The world is rapidly expanding, but Jesus and Jesus alone and his wisdom and his knowledge is the only thing, Eric, that can stabilize our souls, stabilize our home, stabilize our faith, and don't allow artificial intelligence <laughs> to take precedence yeah. over the beauty and the wonder and the knowledge of Jesus and the knowledge of his word. And that's the hour that we're in. Of course, this alludes to revelation and things that we could say, how would this technology take place? That yeah. there could be a mark and antichrist. We're seeing this, that this could become the technology that takes place. And so what I would just say to all believers and those at the sound of our voice, these things must be. Yeah. It's here, it's time, and it's a the powerful- The genie's out of the bottle, as they say. In going forward here with AI, uh, we've heard oftentimes about some of the people involved in tech, and you've traveled in that world, very very knowledgeable about it, and you've rubbed shoulders with some of these folks, yes. I'm sure. Do you get the sense that some are saying, look, we can, and talking about this from kind of a biblical perspective, we can achieve immortality even through AI. It sounds crazy to some, but is there kind of a movement among, in some quarters, 
to do just that, to, to in essence, play God through AI. Absolutely, Eric. And I think it's, it's coming down to something that uh, a few people are calling the singularity. And the singularity is the merging of man with machine. And in some ways, they believe that that's going to make them stronger, immortal, better. And not even understanding who man is in their own discernment. They're not even sure what it is. What, why are we here? What are we doing? What, what are our sp spiritual principles? So they're, they're getting to this point of merging with the machine without a, this understanding. And the belief is somehow the, the intelligence and in who you are is going to be transferred in a machine and you would live there for your eternity. And that does not sound like anything biblical to me positive. So there is that, but there's a subtext which is really profound to me, is that as you run deeper into all forms of technology, whether it be physics, I studied a lot of physics, uh, <clears throat> even mathematics, and definitely with an AI, we start seeing an orderly structure, something that is very, very profound. And it is leading people, I think, to a level that I have not expected, and is starting to rise, especially within the AI community, people are becoming more Christian, or becoming Christian, period. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating to me because as you understand what this technology means and what it's doing, it's drawing you more into trying to seek what are the ancient wisdom words? Yeah. How did we get here? Pastor has shown me so many different connections, prophesies that we will yeah. get to this moment. And we are at this moment. We're it's, at this moment. That is so encouraging, Brian, to hear that, because a lot of times you think of Silicon Valley and the tech community, very, very secular, uh, obviously. Yes. But to me, it's fascinating and so encouraging to hear that these people are literally coming to the Lord through yes. studying this technology. Yes. You know, and I think it's, a, a, again, a thing of maturity. I think when you're younger, you're, you're sort of defiant and kind of rebellious. And then as you move along, you start saying, well, there was some wisdom there. And maybe you had somebody in the family or yeah. somebody indirectly, or you turned on, you turned on TBN and you saw something and you said, you know, that, that, that made a mark, but maybe not today, 10 years later. And I think I'm starting to see that a lot more. Pastor Matt, Brian and I talked about this earlier. I wanted to ask you about it as well. Can Christians use AI to our benefit to spread the gospel and further the kingdom of God? 100%. Let, let's face it, everything about, everything about the Father, everything about His Son is redemptive, to buy back. So God wants to use it in a redemptive way, Eric, in, in, in a redemptive way, and use it for the spreading of the gospel and the expansion of those things. So there is a redemptive plan of God to it, and I believe that. So absolutely, there's a way to amplify the Word of God, to spread the gospel, to have connections. So no doubt, the, the, the redemptive plan of God is at work. And then I think God will release that to become the fullness of his eternal plan. But there is a redemptive way that God wants to use this and utilize this and keep this in that way. We just got to have the wisdom and the counsel to steward it properly. Like everything. I mean, yeah. if, if money's neutral, how you use it, like there's a lot of things that can kind of come under our hands with a sense of responsibility that we've got to have a, a redemptive, a purity to it and an innocence to it. What it can lead to, of course, it could be very destructive, but we want to keep that in that way of a, of a very redemptive way. It's God's heart. Yeah. And Brian, you mentioned yeah. the Gutenberg Bible earlier. I think yes. that's a great parallel uh, as well. And, and we were saying earlier, guys, off camera, Brian, I think God has uniquely positioned you to be a believer and to be so adept and expert in this field is pretty unique. And it speaks to what you're saying, Pastor Matt, that as Christians at the end of the day, we really need to be salt and light in this yeah. time. Yes. It was so inspiring what you were saying earlier, Pastor Matt, that we are called by name, yes. uh, by God Almighty, for That's such it. a time That's as it. this. What a That's high it. honor and a privilege. The Way of Truth, That's great right. new book, the way of truth. Uh, which speaks to all these concepts you're laying out for us today. Brian Romley, of course, you're everywhere. We're checking you out on Twitter yes. and beyond. Gentlemen, God bless you. We can't thank you enough for breaking this down, making it easy to understand for our audience. This, this world-changing, history-altering technology we all need to know about it. The genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. Yes. But at the end of the day, God is still on the throne. He's in control. And you guys both drove that point home. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank God you. bless. We Such appreciate it. It's an honor it. to be here. It was an honor to have you. Great Thanks, to be guys. here. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate guys. Not long before he died, the famous British physicist Stephen Hawking said the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end 
of the human race. Are we rapidly approaching a day where science fiction becomes reality and where humanity pushes God to the margins in favor of advanced technology? The Bible makes a few things very clear. First, no matter what may come, as Christians, we're not to give in to fear. Rather, we can look to the future with confidence, knowing that God will never leave us or forsake us. And second, through every new innovation throughout history, the church has only grown, and the message of Jesus has spread to the ends of the earth. The rise of AI may change our lives in profound ways, but it can't stop the gospel. Thanks for watching, and God bless.